drums got repossessed. I'm really sorry. <laughs> no, we, we feel like we're a more streamlined operation now. We can basically work, just take whatever we got on a job site. And well, we've been doing birthday parties. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is really gets in a cab quickly. All right. I guess we're starting. You're starting. Fucks up the whole show in the first 30 seconds. Too distracting. So that was a god, Bess, an Egyptian god, one of the few gods in the Egyptian pantheon who was represented in a kind of full frontal context. It was dwarfish and hideous. It's possible that he came from a lion. I was thinking about that in relationship to Adam's beautiful show of iconography Im images. This creature. Um, Bess uh, was a kind of, despite his hideousness, was a, one of the more popular Egyptian gods. He was the enemy of all that was evil and the friend of all that was good, including music, sexual pleasure. He always had a tran was portrayed often with a tambourine in his hand. Uh, the subject is jumping today. And I was, there's only one song that I know that rhymes trampoline and tambourine. Uh, by the uh, London rapper uh, Tiny Tempa, uh, and in that rhyme he has a, he has a, he has a very in another interesting rhyme, which is uh, I I go to Claridge's um, for high tea, and I wear my Jordans just like Spike Lee. That's probably the only <laughs> rhyming of high tea and Spike Lee that I know about. It's nice. I agree. It's a terrible song. It's a good song. You're just, just an old guy. Uh, the history of jumping as a uh, competition or as a, as a measurable skill goes back, obviously, to the uh, Greek Olympic Games. Uh, which they would jump with uh, weights, that, which they would swing in front of their bodies in order to give themselves uh, greater uh, momentum, uh, called uh, uh, halteres. Halter halter uh, one of the great champions of the early Olympics, I think 450 BC, was a man named Toynus, who actually could jump the equivalent of 23 feet. Uh, in the system, which would have won him an Olympic gold medal in the modern Olympic Games, in fact, placed him in the top 10 uh, until about 1952. I don't know whether the weights were a help or a hindrance. They were like 26 pounds. You had to be very strong to uh, carry them. Um, most of the Olympic Games at that time, of course, were uh, in sort of preparation or reflection of the, need, the military needs of the country. Um, that were participating. Choinus' uh, record of winning not just the uh, long jump, but the sprint and the 400-meter dash, which were the only uh, races that were uh, 
uh, held at the time, lasted for almost 200 years until uh, a man, uh, he was from Sparta, I think, a man from uh, Sicily named uh, Astelos won the three events and uh, the event, a new event called the Hippodromus, which was a run in, not in full armor, but you wore a helmet and carried a 50 pound shield and often ran with uh, greaves on your legs for about 400 meters, which coincidentally was also the, the distance that a uh, average Persian bowman could shoot an arrow. So basically, they were training soldiers to run into arrows. And Estelos won. And immediately, the followers of Choinos added a special uh, addendum to his statue in Sparta that said when he competed, the Hippodromos was not uh, held. So in effect, the first asterisk, the first sports nerds that we know uh, occurred over 600, uh, 5,200, uh, 2,500 years ago, his followers were, you know, basically it was sort of a, if Babe Ruth's record was going to be broken by Roger Maris, they had to put an asterisk in saying there was an extra game. So they put an asterisk into his record saying the other guy had an extra event. Trampolines are relatively recent, although if you look in, uh, in Don Quixote, Sancho Panza is blanketed. The uh, blanketing, throwing somebody up and down in a blanket was a uh, form of punishment or entertainment um, that's recorded uh, in some of the uh, passion plays and, uh, and the, the Bruegel painting of the game's children play, uh, which are 84 games that were popular in the 15th century. There's no image of uh, blanketing being done, but there's something called bum bouncing, which is you put somebody on a board and you bounce them up and down on the board. And I'm not sure if that's supposed to be pleasant or unpleasant. Um, hockey goalies do that to celebrate goals on their own team, but it's, it's a very violent thing to watch. The trampoline as we know it, the modern trampoline, uh, it was actually invented by two men, uh, George Nissen and Larry Griswold in the 1930s. They were uh, both athletes at the University of Iowa, which makes them near and dear to my heart. Uh, they were divers and tumblers, gymnasts and tumblers. And if you have ever been around a swimming team or gymnastic teams, you know that those guys are the craziest people in the world. They will do anything jump on anything, and these men were no exception. Um, in addition to creating this, uh, uh, this new uh, system, the, the trampoline, they formed the vaudeville teams and went around the world with a very highly uh, perfected uh, routine that um, is, is quite remarkable to watch. If, you, if, you, if you're interested, there's a four minute clip on YouTube of Larry Griswold in 1951. So he'd be about in his mid 40s. And he's on the Frank Sinatra show of all things. I didn't know Frank Sinatra had a, uh, had a variety show in the 50s. He looked, you know, he's in his very cool suit and he's in front of a stage and he says, and now one of the great artists of his medium uh, will uh, perform for you. And this man comes out in basically a kind of a baggy pants uh, comic outfit. His hat is sort of slammed down on his head and he's, he sort of shuffles in. Behind them is a diving board and a, uh, a swimming pool. And he explains, he, he says that he is Larry uh, Griswold's father. Larry Griswold, he said, has been uh, celebrating too much and he can't come to the show, but the father says, uh, I know his routine. I've known him since he was a little boy. That's, that's his big joke. You know, that he, and, 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 he, and then he goes through this very elaborate routine, which is obviously crafted from hundreds and hundreds of hours of trial and error, where he climbs up this, I think, an eight foot ladder, and he falls down several times. He gets on the uh, diving board, and 
he keeps having these mishaps which cause him to sort of crash to the point, catch himself at the last moment over and over again. And pretty soon he has the audience in the, in the palm of his hand um, as one catastrophe builds on top of another uh, until finally he jumps off the, uh, the board into the pool of water, which turns out to be a diving, uh, a, pla a, a hidden trampoline. And he, he does a, a series of routines and then returns to the diving board and, and sort of lands flat on the board, puts his head in his hands and sort of looks back at the audience with this grin on his face, like sort of complete mastery. Uh, and this routine, this idea of the, of the incompetent or the drunk who seems uh, at first to be in danger but then it la later redeems himself is also a kind of a staple of, uh, of all kinds of, of, of entertainments going far back in uh, the world. The, uh, there's, a, there's a passage in uh, Huckleberry Finn where he's at a circus and he's horrified when this drunken man comes out of the crowd and, and convinces the uh, ringmaster to let him climb on a horse. And the crowd is laughing and hooting as this guy does basically the same routine that you see Larry Griswold doing on the, on the diving board. He climbs on the horse and then he falls off the horse and he climbs on, the horse is running around and the audience is laughing and Hunt is such a naive and sweet person that he's, he's worried that the, the man's going to hurt himself. And then he says, and then he got on the horse and he starts throwing his clothes off one piece after another until finally he's standing on the horse in this spangly outfit as tall and handsome as you please, riding around in, uh, on the horse. And then he says, it was, one of, it was one of the ringmaster's own men. He put one over on him. He still he never quite got the joke. But he was very relieved that he was uh, not going to hurt himself. He just felt bad for the ringmaster for having lost control of his show somehow. Um, well, I, that idea of disaster that sort of turns into something um, humorous is, is something that's very interesting. <laughs> What? What? Yeah. I think I totally wrecked this one. Here. You can hold that. I think we've ruined our apparatus. Is this right? Look, I had to follow the comic rule of threes. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. But now we've totally lost not only the, this, the rope. It proves I have whiplash. That proves. <laughs> um, yeah, that's Larry's problem. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the trampoline itself actually comes from a circus net. Uh, I, uh, I think what happened was Nisa, uh, Griswold watched people, uh, acrobats, falling off of trapeze and, bound, and rebounding and realized that could be turned into a, uh, an asset. The first person to <coughs> benefit from a circus net was a young boy named uh, El Nino Farini. He had very curly hair, he was very sweet looking, and he had a very strange routine that his father, his adopted father, he was an orphan, had created for him. I haven't showed you this, Tim, yet, but he hung from his neck from a trapeze and he played the drums. And hanging up 180 feet in the air, just by hanging his neck like this, but they gave him a net to uh, fall into in case he... Um, after he got too old to be a uh, infant phenomenon, he transformed into the beautiful Lulu. Uh, 
called The Beautiful Lulu, uh, The Girl Aerialist, and uh, Circassian uh, Cattle Poultice. Uh, the Circassian women were supposed to be the most beautiful in the world. In the world. And he sort of, he went into, uh, he went into a kind of uh, eclipse and then returned as the beautiful Lulu. And the act uh, was another groundbreaking uh, effect. He stood on, a, or she stood on a platform and the unseen spring would then catapult her 30 feet into the air onto a, a narrow trapeze like this. And she was a great sensation and broke many hearts until one day the uh, catapult mechanism malfunctioned and smashed her into the uh, platform. Uh, she was hauled off to the infirmary where her identity was revealed and she had to give up that part of her act. Um, um, there was another uh, performer a bit later, I don't know if you ever heard of, uh, named Barbette the, en the Enigma. Uh, she was a very famous trapeze artist. Actually, it was a man named uh, Vander Clyde in Round Rock, Texas, who fell in love with the circus. And um, as an early, at an early age began performing uh, dressed as a girl because uh, he replaced one of the two sisters in an act and they only had costumes for girls. But he went to Paris uh, and became an incredible sensation um, with this act where he would, he, he, he dressed as uh, Barbette and performed this amazing show. And at the end of the show, he would take off his wig and reveal that he was a man. Uh, he's the basis of the play Victor Victoria and then the movie Victor Victoria, where they sort of balderized the situation, had a woman playing a man playing a woman. But John Carteau fell in love with him and wrote a whole thesis about how modern theater was sort of based on this idea of the illusion that he created uh, by somehow a uh, forcing you to ignore the, what Carteau called the sort of masculine abilities to become an aerialist into this character of this female by throwing dust in the eyes of the audience. And only at the end, when the reveal happened, did he seem to now be playing the part of a man who he never quite accepted. Um, uh, he said, I can't remember the phrase, uh, an angel, a flower, a bird was the, was the name of the essay. He was all of these things. Uh, Man Ray took a series of photographs of him, really beautiful photographs of Barbette. Um, The affair with Carteau didn't last. He ended up back in Round, Round Rock, Texas, um, and had sort of a, a career as a, as a di designer of Disney films, but uh, or aerialist effects. But you should look at those pictures of Barbette the, uh, Barbette the Enigma. Billy Tipton uh, was a jazz pianist, uh, was active mostly in Spokane, Washington uh, in the 30s and 40s, uh, a very dapper guy who uh, did not succeed wholly as a, uh, as a jazz musician, he, he had a chance to go big time when his group was picked up, was asked by Liberace to join him uh, in uh, Las Vegas, but he preferred to stay in, out of the limelight in, uh, in Spokane, where he sort of had a du dual career. He stopped performing so much, he became a, uh, a booker of, a of acts and an MC at local clubs, where he was famous for his sort of salacious uh, commentary. He had a number of very bad jokes that he liked to tell. Say, there are three sexes, the male sex, the female sex, and insects. And 
not going to give you a rim shot? I thought I was going to get a rim shot from him. Right, right, right. All right. Or he say, they say it's a struggle to be a modern woman, and I, uh, I agree. Anybody would agree if you've ever seen a woman try to get into her girdle. You're not listening. Girdle. Get into her girdle. All right. At the end of his life, when he was dying, uh, his son was in his trailer home, and he realized he was not going to revive. And they called the doctor, and the doctor came and tried to give, uh, get his heart moving again and asked his son if his father had had a sex change operation. And he said, no, his, Billy Tipton had been born Dorothy Tipton and had decided at the age of 20 to, uh, to live as a man in order to have a career as a jazz musician. She was, he was married several times. He had three adopted sons. Nobody but two of his cousins ever knew. He had a, he had a whole system of wrapping his chest and he explained to anybody who asked that he had had a childhood accident and he needed the support to keep his broken ribs in place. He had a prosthetic device. Uh, to, uh, he said he had a terrible automobile accident uh, and it had sort of wrecked his uh, genitals. But at the end of his life, he'd gotten rid of all this material and this interesting biography of him that sort of indicates that he was his whole life had been this elaborate performance. He totally dedicated himself to this persona that he created uh, for reasons of his own, and that he was prepared with all these, you know, in his entire life, all the jokes that he told that sort of walked the line between uh, performance and gender uh, were hints that he was sort of leaving to the world for the final reveal that he had sort of planned over 40 years to walk out uh, and let people know who he was after he was exited the uh, exited stage left. Philippe Halsman, the famous photographer, a fashion photographer of the uh, second half of the 20th century, he's one of his most famous images is of uh, the aging Einstein after the war when he was racked with uh, guilt about his part in uh, the creation of the atomic bomb program. But Halston had another project that was sort of closer to his heart. He collaborated with another surrealist, uh, Salvador Dali, on a series of photographs, the most famous one of which is uh, Dali in midair painting a picture as three cats fly by in the mid space and a huge dash of water um, obscures the foreground. You've probably seen that someplace or another. That was part of a series of images that a photograph that he took called the jump series. He said that he thought that when people were in midair, when they jumped, they lost all pretense and revealed their true nature. Uh, it's a beautiful pictures of Marilyn Monroe leaping. Um, he said she, the ways that she tucked her legs under her body uh, in space sort of revealed the, little, the lost little girl in her. Um, some people, even in midair, didn't seem to lose, uh, couldn't sort of rid themselves of their, uh, of their reserve. This is an amazing picture of Richard Nixon in his in his Senate chambers jumping. He looks just as stiff and tight as he ever was, but he's several inches off the ground. There's an image of uh, a man named uh, Learned Hand, who was a very uh, famous and uh, respected judge called the 10th Supreme Court judge in the 50s and 60s. He was 87 at the time. There's a picture of him in his chambers also leaping a couple of inches off the ground. This is a special interest to me because a Learned Hand was my father's uh, hero. They'd worked together on uh, a model penal code 
uh, and he named my youngest brother Tom after him, Learned Hand, and in his, uh, his study was a huge picture of Learned Hand in a much more traditional repose with his hands on a law book, um, looking dolefully into the camera, or away, I guess, off the camera. The image of him jumping uh, is quite remarkable in con contrast to that. It's interesting that Halsman had this idea about jumps as the sort of uh, the uh, royal road to the unconscious of the person because in his whole, his own life, as a young man in Austria, before he'd become a photographer, he went through an extraordinary experience uh, which has to have some effect on his decision uh, not only become a photographer but the subjects that he chose. He was hiking with his father a, uh, a dentist in the Alps, and they were walking along a pass, and he turned to look back at his father and saw him falling off a cliff. Uh, and he saw him silhouetted against uh, the sky, the image is quite remarkable, above the, uh, above the horizon line, just sort of hanging in space. By the time he got to the bottom of the gorge, his father was dead. But when he reported the case to the authorities, he was arrested for murder. It, it was a kind of a, it was a, a, a Dreyfus a case of the 1920s. The anti-Semitism was, was on the, on the rise in, in Austria and Germany at the time, and he was, he was charged with patricide. And they had a kind of a, a kangaroo court that sentenced to uh, 10 years in solitary confinement. And his sister began this extraordinary campaign to uh, exonerate him. And there was a retrial, and sort of the intelligentsia of, of, of Germany lined up behind him, Einstein, Thomas Mann, and Freud. Sigmund Freud wrote a letter, which is kind of interesting, because one of the, uh, one of the factors that the, the uh, jury just, uh, convicted him on was uh, the Oedipus complex, they said. <laughs> He said he was he was um, he wanted to kill his father and marry his mother, so he pushed his father off of the uh, cliff. And so, who better to ask about the Oedipus complex than Freud? And Freud said, "You can't convict the man of the Oedipus uh, of murder on the grounds of the Oedipus complex because the Oedipus complex is always present." And then he told, I guess, what he would consider a, an anecdote or a joke. He said, "A man was." Uh, found with a crowbar and convicted of the crime of breaking and entering. And at his uh, sentencing hearing, he said, uh, I would like to be uh, convicted of adultery as well, because I also have the tools for that on my person. And uh, in any case, he got, he got Hosman off, and oh, Freud gets a rim shot. Uh, yeah, yeah. The first parachute jump occurred from a hydrogen balloon in 1797. It's interesting that there have always been these intrepid, crazy people willing to do things that none of the rest of us would ever consider doing. This uh, man named um, André Jacques uh, Garnerin uh, hooked up this sort of 23-foot uh, sail to the bottom of this hydrogen balloon, went up 3,200 feet, cut himself loose. He didn't have a vent in it, so basically this thing went down like a corkscrew, but he survived and became one of the more celebrated aeronauts of his time. Uh, a few months later, it had been the first of Bromier. This was in post-revolutionary time. So this is the sixth year of, of the revolutionary, uh, short-lived revolutionary calendar. He proposed to take a woman up into space with him, a woman known only as Citizen Henri, Citoyen Henri, this very young and beautiful woman, apparently. And he was denied a permit to go into uh, space with her on the grounds that the uh, decreased air pressure aloft would uh, collapse her delicate female organs and she would
suffer. Also, it was ungentlemanly to take a woman into such uh, dangerous positions. Um, also, it was unseemly that they would be up uh, in space together without a chaperone. But he was very uh, determined. He appealed to the uh, chief magistrate of Paris, who reviewed the documents and decided that uh, the fact that she wanted to go into space uh, was evidence that she considered it a uh, feasible endeavor, and that there was nothing inherently more um, morally questionable about ascending in a basket into the air than there was about jumping into a carriage together, which I like that expression, jumping into a carriage together. So they went up in space, uh, and they were fine, and shortly after, uh, Jean-Ron's own wife became the first woman to uh, successfully parachute uh, from space. Besides the uh, Greeks and their Olympic Games, there are very few ways of measuring um, physical abilities before the sort of advent of modern uh, co uh, co contemporary uh, athletics, but Jumping has always been a measure by which people sought to distinguish themselves uh, as uh, art, a athletic uh, phenomenons. Uh, Alberti, the, uh, the father of single point perspective, uh, was a very uh, famous uh, athlete as a youth. And his, uh, his great ability was apparently that he could jump entirely over another human being. Uh, this is his own report, so we haven't any verification, but I like the idea of Alberti jumping over another human being. The other person who seemed to have been a uh, remarkable athlete, who you might not have thought of in that uh, context, was Nathan Hale, the famous, highly unsuccessful spy, uh, who was hung uh, somewhere around where uh, Saks Fifth Avenue is today in, in Manhattan. Uh, as a young man, uh, he was said to be able to put his hand on a fence post as tall as he was and then vault entirely over that. Uh, I can't even tell if that's an extraordinary thing. I guess that's pretty hard to do. Um, it didn't do him any good at the end. Just brief mentions of two other jumps that I consider interesting. The uh, Evil Knievel Snake River Canyon jump. That's 1974. I think it was the same day that um, Nixon was indicted. Uh, the the uh, chute deployed prematurely, and he went safely but ignominiously to the bottom of the canyon. Uh, and then um, at about the same time, uh, Jaws was a f popular movie, and on uh, Happy Days, to take advantage of the fact that Henry Winkler, the actor, was an accomplished uh, water skier, there was an episode in which he jumps over a tank of sharks. And this was retroactively uh, considered by some to be the moment when the show lost its creative headway and the phrase, uh, jumping the shark, came uh, as a result of that. Although it's been pointed out that that was a very popular episode and the show actually lasted six more years. I don't think that has anything to do to un deny the, the lack of creative uh, originality in the, in the show after that. Superman, as originally conceived, was a much more limited character than the one that we know today. The phrase, you know, faster than a speeding bullet, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound, is literally true. That's what he could do. He could leap tall buildings in a single bound. He could jump 700 feet, about an eighth of a mile, um, which was considered about as much as anybody could imagine anybody being able to do. It was only as his, as, as, the, as the stories went on and they had to create uh, a kind of more and more fabulous character 
that he began to take on the ability not just to run and jump, but to fly and then eventually to fly so fast that he could literally turn time around. No matter how powerful he got, he was always vulnerable to kryptonite and the debilitating rays of a red sun and to magic. As long as there was this kind of a supernatural effect, uh, we were comfortable with the idea that even Superman could be um, challenged. And in fact, in magic performances going back innumerable ages, the ability to move so swiftly that you appear to be in two places at once to defeat time and space has been a staple. Uh, the performers who are most adept at that are called quick change artists. They usually operate with a body double. Uh, you see one person with a blackout or some effect and then they appear in another place. Uh, one of the first people to master this was a, uh, an Austrian named uh, Sigmund Neuberger who began touring. His, his father was a, had a, a business in, in Manhattan, but he went out west with a man named Mike Whelan and they had a, uh, a quick change routine that they did at the mining camps around uh, the west. And they did pretty well, but eventually they broke up. He came back to uh, the east and he began to develop his own uh, show. Uh, he became friendly with another young uh, Jewish performer named Eric Weiss, better known as Houdini, who noticed that Lafayette had few friends. He was a very severe, remote sort of guy. So one day he gave him a pet dog named Beauty. He said, you know, a man without a friend needs man's best friend. And Lafayette fell hard for this dog named Beauty. Uh, it became sort of the apple of his eye. It traveled with him, it ate, had its own hotel room, it ate five meals a day. One day while he was performing his routine, the dog wandered on the stage and he got the biggest applause that he'd ever had in his life and he realized he was on to something. He began to incorporate the dog into his act and he quickly became the most popular, highly paid performer of his time, far eclipsing Houdini. Uh, he was paid, I think, the equivalent of over almost four million dollars a year. He had a plaque out on his private car that said, the more I see of people, the more I prefer my dog and another plaque on his apartment that said, you may eat my food, you may order my servants, but you must respect my dog. And his routine was very elaborate, it was three hours long, it was apparently kind of fabulous. It was very heavily weighted towards animals and sort of narratives. He had a lion named Prince and an Arabian horse. And instead of just performing acts, he would create these tableaus, these stories where he would evolve things would happen. Uh, the, the climax was usually that the, the lion prince was placed on a, an electric uh, plate that would give him a shock and he would roar. And then over here, there would be a, a, a damsel in distress and the lion would run at the damsel, the, the, uh, the gates would, and then, and then she would turn into Lafayette and then it would jump at her and pass over her into the audience and at the last moment the lion would turn into Lafayette. You know, it always got the crowd. In Edinburgh where they were performing this, <coughs> Beauty the dog suddenly died of old age and, and the rich diet that uh, Lafayette had been feeding him and he was inconsolable. He, uh, he said he was going to follow the dog to the grave and everybody told him that was silly. And then he negotiated with the local cemetery to have the dog buried 
um, in a, a human cemetery uh, on the grounds that if, when, he, when he eventually died himself, he would be buried with the dog. But the show must go on, and he continued to perform uh, later that week while they were performing the final lion change. His, uh, Chinese lanterns on the stage caught fire, and the whole stage began to go up into flames. Somebody chopped a cord, and the, the, uh, the uh, fire uh, curtain fell down, and the uh, quick-thinking orchestra leader played God Save the King, and everybody stood up and exited the theater. So the audience was OK, but behind the scenes, there was chaos. The lion's mane had caught on fire, it was running around, all the extras were on fire. Lafayette, who was sort of paranoid about people stealing his tricks, had chained the doors, all the doors but one, where the lion was lying, burning. Uh, and so there were reports that, that Lafayette was actually seen outside of the theater as the fire was raging. Uh, and he said, I have to go back in and save my horse. And he went back in, and then the building collapsed. And everybody inside was lost. After the fire died down, they went back in and they found his charred corpse with his sword burned beyond recognition next to the lion and the horse. And they made arrangements for a funeral. And they began to, several days, more work required to clear the stage. Eventually, they found a trap door. Underneath was Lafayette's body, unburnt. But this was the real Lafayette with his swords and his jewels. Apparently, what they discovered was the body double in the, in the rubble. And that he had been able to somehow get into his trap door, but hadn't gotten out. So he had, in fact, cheated death one last time. He was buried with his dog. Uh, they couldn't get a rabbi to perform the ceremony, but uh, a local priest did. It was the biggest, it was the biggest hit, the biggest uh, funeral anybody had seen in Edinburgh, and I guess you can still go see uh, the grave to this day. Oh, I, I think Houdini sent a, a spray of flowers to the uh, funeral in the shape of the dog, Beauty, with a note saying, the man who gave you your best friend, your friend, Houdini. Houdini had an act that was supposed to uh, tempt fate, death himself, his most effective act. He had himself chained and, and manacled and placed in a, 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 a milk uh, canister hold, I guess, several hundred gallons, a uh, little cutaway. He would be, he would be inside, um, all chained up. They would then bolt the lid on and then put down a screen. And then just when everybody thought he was a goner, he would emerge. He survived all this. He, as you probably know, died when somebody punched him in the belly when he wasn't expecting it. Uh, after his death, this stunt continued to be performed by a number of uh, magicians, including a man named Genesta, who made a good living on it until uh, one day he didn't, he didn't get out. It turned out that the morning of the event, his uh, assistants had dropped the can and neglected to tell him and had made a small dent in the lid. And the way the trick works is when the screen is down, you just lift off this top part once you're unchained and you get out. But because of this dent, the uh, top was mechanically locked into place. Always check your equipment. I guess I should have. Sometimes it's not necessary to threaten to have actually life uh, or death on the line. The illusion of death or danger is enough to create danger. Uh, in uh, 1938 in Shawsville, a small town uh, outside uh, Montreal, Quebec, a a magician with uh, a small touring uh, circus, his name was Lamont, was preparing to perform the famous Saw Lady in Half Trick. 
And he was in performing in front of an audience of people who apparently had not, not, not even, had not seen live theater, they hadn't seen magic. And as soon as he said he was going to saw this woman in half, one of the farmers ran on stage, grabbed one of his swords, and ran him through with it. And at the inquest, he said he just couldn't stand to see that nice woman cut in half by that man. <laughs> Keller wanted to, I mean, uh, Houdini wanted to try a very famous trick, uh, the bullet catch trick, and he was dissuaded by his friend, an older magician named uh, Harry Keller. Harry Keller was famous for his self-decapitation routine, where he would cause his head to uh, leave his body uh, and float around the room. Uh, he was the model for the Wizard of Oz that Frank ba when Frank Baum wrote that. He, he looked exactly like the Wizard of Oz that you see in the film. But he wrote a letter to Houdini, which Houdini apparently paid attention to, which said that uh, the world needs Houdini more than it needs anybody, another person trying to do the bullet catch trick. So please do not attempt this trick. So he didn't. The bullet catch trick is, in fact, one of the more dangerous tricks in the magician's repertoire. Uh, since the invention of the gun, dozens of people have been killed. The first was a man named uh, Curlew of Lorraine, who wasn't killed by the bullet, but by the assistant who was uh, shooting him, beat him to death with the other end of the gun. That's, that's the only thing I knew. Uh, more problems with assistants. Um, a woman named uh, Madame uh, du, uh, de Linksy, who was a, 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 she performed with her husband, uh, and they performed this feat, uh, it was a bullet catch by firing squad. They would have a, a, a bunch of soldiers would march out, line up, and shoot her. At the time, the way that you would, you would uh, fire a gun is you would bite off the cartridge, pour the uh, gunpowder into the barrel, and then drop the bullet in. And uh, the, the soldiers were in on the trick, and so they were told to keep the bullet in their mouth which worked until it didn't work, and one of the soldiers forgot and spit his bullet into the gun, and that was the end of Madame de Linti and her unborn child. Uh, one other ironic death was a man named Professor Epstein. I think a man named Epstein in 1869 would have another name, but he called himself Professor Epstein, and he did the bullet catch trick, but instead of using a ramrod to load the gun, he used his magic wand uh, to stick the bullet down. Usually there would be a little uh, contraption at the end of the gun that would take the bullet, or the ramrod, that would take the bullet t out. But his magic wand was uh, wooden, and it snapped off, apparently, in the muzzle. And he didn't realize it. When the gun was fired, he received his own magic wand in his forehead and died a gruesome and highly ironic death. Uh, but the most famous uh, bullet catch death was by a man named uh, <coughs> Chung Ling Su. Chung Ling Su's real name was uh, uh, William Robinson, and he'd done a, a series, like most of these guys, they'd created these alternate personas for themselves. First, he tried to imitate a, a German uh, performer whose name was uh, Ben Ali Bey, another uh, the sort of, the, the sort of ex enthusiasm for Eastern duck black magic was, was quite high at the time. And he became a character named uh, uh, Ben Ali, Ahmed Ben Ali. And that didn't catch on. But then uh, this man named um, Jingling Fu, who was, a, was a, a Chinese performer who had a routine with a water, uh, he, he would make these uh, bowls of water with uh, goldfish appear and disappear. It was very successful, and he had issued a challenge which was sort of traditional at the time that anybody who could explain his trick could win $1,000, and Robinson naively attempted to show him how he did the trick. He, and when he didn't receive the money, he went to London and began to basically, he, he took uh, Fu's act and became Sue, 
and his wife uh, became, whose name was Dot, uh, became Sui Su, and they became the most famous uh, performers in London at the time. He was actually a very good magician, uh, and when Fu finally came to London, they had a kind of a magician off, and, and Fu, who was the original, had to actually leave because people thought Su was the real deal. Even though he was, a, he was a Westerner, he made up a story that he was the son of a Chinese woman and an American, uh, and a, and a Scottish missionary. He never spoke English out loud. He sort of, again, lived this entire persona uh, night and day. Uh, he at one point fell out of love with Dot, his uh, common-law wife, and had a, a relationship with another woman, but he continued to employ Dot as his stage assistant and maintained a professional uh, relationship, which included Dot loading the trick gun that uh, created the uh, bullet catch effect. <laughs> and this again worked until it didn't work. Uh, and he was shot in the chest and issued his first and last words in English from the stage, which were, I've been shot, uh, lower the curtain. And the inquest, I thought was cleared. The explanation was that over the years they had a, uh, a double barrel system. Uh, and he never, he didn't, and, and you would put the bullet in here and you would put the gunpowder in here. But he never cleared out the gunpowder. So eventually you get this loud explosion. There was this res residual, this residue of gunpowder built up to wore a small hole in the. Uh, metal that separated the two barrels, and finally a spark went off and shot the bullet into Sue. His success as this pseudo-Chinese uh, performer reflected a kind of fascination throughout uh, the West with the exotic East. Um, and it wasn't just magicians, uh, but also writers who sort of reflected this uh, fascination. There was a, a man named uh, Hearn, Laf, uh, uh, Lafcadio Hearn, uh, was born on Lafkos, an island in Greece. His mother was an illiterate uh, Greek noblewoman, and his father was a surgeon in the British Navy from Ireland. And soon after he was born, they sent him to Dublin to live. Uh, his mother abandoned him. And soon after that, his, his parents, his, his father's family sent him to, to Ohio, to Cincinnati, Ohio, of all places, um, to go stay with an in-law who took one look at him, gave him five dollars, and told him to make his way in the new world. Uh, he was a kind of a contrarian fellow. He, had, he, was, uh, he, had one, he was disfigured by a, 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 some sort of fight as a young boy. He, he never, you could, all the pictures of him show him from the right profile. His left eye was apparently dis, discolored and disfigured. Um, but he got work as a newspaper man in Cincinnati and began to write stories about the sort of under, rough and tumble underworld of Cincinnati and became quite uh, successful uh, until he married a young black woman, uh, which was against the law, and he lost his job. And he went to New Orleans, and he started his life again without his wife. Uh, he lost all his money in a ill-fated restaurant venture, and, but he got, began to get more jobs as a, uh, as a correspondent describing life in uh, New Orleans. He's in fact considered to be responsible for the sort of vision we have of New Orleans to this day as this exotic place of, of mystery and magic. He was something of a debunker, but he wrote a lot about uh, voodoo and, and uh, various Santeria effects. and became a, a national correspondent writing about this world in New Orleans. And then he moved to the West Indies for a couple of years and wrote about that. And then he talked his way into um, allowing the, I think the Atlantic Monthly sent him to Japan 
as a correspondent. And this is where he finally uh, found his world. Uh, he married a Japanese woman. He adopted a Japanese name, uh, Koizumi Yakumo. But he began to write several books a year about uh, Japanese culture, uh, which uh, were very popular in the West. Um, he sort of venerated, celebrated in an almost sort of naive way the sort of pre-Western uh, ethos of the sort of the samurai warrior as a kind of man of honor uh, beyond um, beyond the limitations of sort of Western uh, relativism. And he was so good at this, he became a, 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 a hero of the, the Japanese nationalist movement. After his death, his work was often still read in Japanese schools, uh, and he was sort of utilized as uh, a kind of an apologist for uh, the Japanese colonial ambitions uh, in China, uh, which all of which he uh, would have abhorred in his own life. But he did write a number of, he's most known for his ghost stories. Uh, uh, one of his more famous is the story of uh, Kwa, uh, Kwashin, Kwashin Koji, uh, which is a very elaborate story about an old man who has a, he has a painting uh, that he displays uh, outside the temple of a great shogun. Uh, and he's a Shinto priest, and he, for a few pennies, will describe what you see in this, in this painting. It's uh, the path to hell. And there are goblins and devils and fire. And so it's a horrific painting that he describes very beautifully. And it's a, you know, a gorgeous painting. And they, uh, one of the attendants for the uh, the Lord sees it and invites him in uh, to describe the painting, or to present the painting to the uh, to the Lord. And he he goes through the whole act and he shows the goblins and the devils and the fire. And at the end, uh, the attendant says, but "Would you like to give the painting to the Lord as a uh, a gift?" And he says, the man says, the old man says, "Well." If I did that, I would have nothing to live on. I can't do that. Uh, if you would, if you would pay a hundred ryo, a hundred coins, gold coins for this, I, I could start a new business and he could have the painting. But they're quite offended by this, and they, he's thrown out uh, into the street with his painting, and the attendant follows him out and says, uh, "We won't give you." 100 gold coins for your painting, but we will give you three feet of iron. And he stabs him and takes the painting and presents it and, and brings it back to the uh, Lord. He unrolls the He says, I, I've, I've secured the painting for you. Uh, and they unroll it and it's blank. There's nothing on it. And the, the Lord is outraged and he throws the man in jail, and he serves a, a lengthy prison sentence, and he comes out. He's astonished to hear that Koji, the old man, is presenting the painting in a distant part of the country, and he, he, he pursues him until he finally finds him, and he hauls him back to the Lord, and they bring him in front of the man. He says, how did it happen? They don't, they don't really go into why he's back being alive, but uh, they're more interested in the painting. He said, how did, how did it occur uh, that the painting uh, that uh, you showed us became blank? And he said, all paintings of any worth are ghosts. They have ghosts in them. And they have the desire to be uh, what they want to be. And when you refuse to pay for the painting, it, the painting did not wish to belong to you, so it went away. And if you would pay the hundred coins for it, you would have the painting. So the Lord said, okay, here's a hundred gold coins. 
He gives him the paint, the money, and he gives him the painting, and he enrolls the painting, and sure enough, the figures are back, the goblins and the devils and the river of fire. But the, the colors aren't as vivid as they were before, and the characters, the creatures aren't as alive. And the Lord notices this and asks him, why is the painting inferior? And he says, well, before it was paid for, it was priceless. It, 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 now that you've paid 100 coins for it, it's what it's worth, no more and no less. And the story goes on and on and on, but that, that's, that element became the basis of a much more famous story uh, by uh, the writer uh, Marguerite Yorsenar, a French, a Belgian aristocrat who lived in the United States for most of her life. Uh, she was the first woman elected to the uh, Academy Francaise, apparently. And as the first woman, uh, she had her effect on the, uh, the, the men's room was, not, was changed to say Gents and Marguerite Yosinar. She's the only person I know who had her own name on a, uh, a uh, gender neutral bathroom. But she wrote a story called How uh, Wang Fo Was Saved, uh, which I first saw performed by uh, my friend Hanna Tierney, a wonderful artist who made a sort of a puppet animation of this story. Um, you can see threads of Lafcadio's Hearn's original story here, but it takes a slightly different tact. Wang Fo, how Wang Fo is the story of a, of a painter, another painter, um, and his assistant, Ling. And they go from town to town uh, and Wang Fo paints whatever he can for just enough to eat. And Ling carries all of his work on his back, every drawing that he ever makes of the sky and the earth and the rivers and the seas and the horses and the people. Uh, and he's a, Wang Fo is a, 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 a magnificent painter. Everything he paints comes to life. So farmers have him paint their dogs so that they can have watchdogs. And, and lords have them paint their best warriors so they can have armies. He never gets rich. He just has enough to live on. Ling and Wang Fo had met years before. Ling was a rich young man with a beautiful wife. And he used to go to a tavern because that was the proper thing to do. And he met Wang Fo one night getting drunk. Because Wang Fo was trying to study the expressions of people when they were inebriated. Uh, and so he was becoming inebriated himself. Wang Fo lived for his art and nothing more, nothing less. And in the course of this evening of conversation, he showed Ling the beauty of a fire fly and of a thunderstorm, all things that he'd been afraid of. And, and Ling invites him back to his home uh, to live with them. And he meets his wife, his beautiful wife, uh, and he says to Ling that he'd always wanted to paint the most beautiful princess in the world, but all princesses were too real. And to have a sufficiently unreal princess, he wants Ling to pose as the woman. So he paints Ling as the princess. And then he wants to paint a painting of the most beautiful prince ever, and he has the wife pose as the prince, because no real prince would be sufficiently unreal to realize his vision. As time passes, the wife realizes that Ling prefers the paintings of her to herself. And one day they come outside, Ling and Wang Fo, and they find her hanging from a tree. And Ling is upset, but Wang Fo says that the expression and color of her face is something that he's never seen before, and he wishes to paint it. So they busy themselves with 
mixing the colors and painting the picture of the dead wife, and he forgets to cry. And eventually, he sells all of the goods and articles in the house to support Wang Fo in his art, and they leave the house and they begin to travel around the country, painting uh, the dogs and the horses and the, uh, and the soldiers of the, of the people they meet. One day when they're in an inn and uh, sleeping, soldiers from the emperor, the sky dragon, come to the inn and arrest them. At first he thinks it's because of some bread he'd stolen earlier that day to feed his master, but they're taken in front of the emperor himself, who's described as a man no more than 20 years old, but with the hands of an old man. And he says to Wang Fo, you have ruined my life. I was raised uh, away from people, surrounded only by your paintings. It was not until I was 16 years old and my parents died and I was allowed to go out into the world that I could compare what you had painted to what the world was like. And the world is far inferior to the paintings. Uh, the clouds are not beautiful, as beautiful as, as your clouds, and the sky is not as beautiful as your skies. You've, you've taken all the sweetness of life from me, and there's nothing for me to rule over. Everything that's worth ruling over is uh, in your paintings, and in your eyes, and in your hands. And you've, uh, you've ruined my life. And the only just punishment for that is that you should be deprived of the power you have uh, to misguide the world. So your eyes are going to be taken out, the eyes that see the world that the rest of us don't see, and your hands, which translate that vision into reality, are going to be cut from your body so that you can live inside yourself and you can't torment the rest of the world. When Ling hears that, the assistant pulls his knife and leaps at the uh, emperor, but he's caught. And the emperor says to Ling Wang Fo, well, now I have something else to hate you for. You've caused somebody to love you enough to die for you. And he says, cut, cut his head off. And so Ling jumps away from, jumps away from Wang Fo so he won't, his blood won't... Um, sully his master's robes, and they cut his head from his body, and he falls to the floor. Wang Fo is upset, but he can't help admiring the beautiful stain of crimson on the green jade floor. They take the body away, and the emperor says, I have one thing for you to do before the sentence is carried out, and you lose your eyes and your hands, and he, he hands them an unfinished a painting that he had. He said, this was a painting you did many years ago and you must have been distracted. You only put in the first lines of the sky and the sea. Before I cut off your hands and take out your eyes, you must finish this painting. If you don't do that, I'll burn all the work you've ever done in your life and it will be as though you were a parent who lost all their children. So. Wang Fo sits down to uh, paint, and he's, he's content because he can paint at least one more time. And he begins to paint, and every time he puts a brush stroke on to fill the, uh, the sea, water begins to fill the room, and the courtiers are all afraid to move. As he continues to paint, the room continues to fill with water, then he paints a boat coming around from behind a stone. And the boat gets closer and closer until it enters the room. And there's Ling propelling the boat by a single oar. And Wang Fo says, <coughs> he has, a, he has a, a red ribbon around his neck, a long red ribbon. He says, what? thought you were dead. And Ling says, how can I be dead when you're still alive and in need of my service? And he helps him into the boat. And Wang Fo says, what about all the people in the, uh, 
the room. The room is now filled, and they're all floating underwater beneath them. And he says, Wing says, don't worry. When we leave, the waters will go away. These people were not meant to be lost in paintings. Only the emperor will remember a small maritime bitterness in his heart. And they turn, and they begin to paddle away. And as they paddle away, the room begins to empty of water until they round the rock and disappear forever. Thank you.